coming up on Theater Talk. Growing up, who was your teenage heartthrob? Oh, God. Um, Keith Partridge and Greg Brady. Oops. Oh, I guess I just said too much, didn't I? Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. I hate my name. Eugene Morris Jerome. It is the second worst name ever given to a male child. The first worst is Haskell Fleischman. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. Neil Simon is coming back to Broadway with two of his greatest plays, Brighton Beach Memoirs and Broadway Bound, being done in repertory. Yeah, those two plays are, are I think, really are considered Neil Simon's masterpieces. They've got all those Simon laughs that you would expect, but there's a more depth and richness to these two plays um, than there are in many of the uh, other plays that he did. And so, to celebrate this, we've gone to the Theater Talk archive, and we're presenting a wonderful interview we did with him back in the late 90s. Yes, he came on the show back then. I think uh, he was talking about his memoir. His yes, lively right. memoir about a life his in the memoir. theater. Right. His memoir, yeah. <laughs> right. Neil Simon's Brighton Beach memoirs. Uh, anyway, we're going to show you that interview now. He is a neophyte writer of prose, but you may have heard of a few of his plays. The Odd Couple, Plaza Suite, California Suite, Barefoot in the Park, London Suite. Our guest, of course, is Neil Simon. Mr. Simon, welcome to Theater Talk. Theater Talk Suite. Theater Talk Suite, <laughs> that's right. The book is called Rewrites. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, many interviews, you, you said that you are a rewriter. You rewrite everything. You've always been that way, even when you start out doing the jokes for television? Always, never satisfied with something? Always going well, back, polishing, cleaning? When I worked for television, I never worked alone. When I was writing on your show of shows, there were seven or eight of us. When I worked on uh, Bilko, there were two or three of us. Uh, when I worked with my brother, there was just the four of us. So, uh, now that I write alone <clears throat> for the past 40 some odd years, I rewrite everything. Let's start with your first play where the book starts, um, Come Blow Your Horn, mm -hmm. first play you ever wrote. Uh, why did you want to give up the television to go write a play? <laughs> Weren't you having a good time? No, I wanted to write plays. I wanted to be a playwright. I wanted to be a real writer. Working in television, you're always writing with other people and you just haven't... You, a, have no identity, and also you never write out of your own self, your own feelings. You're always writing what red buttons want you to say, right. or, or whomever. Or Jerry Lewis. Or Jerry Lewis. Well, I did it once or twice. But you, you were, what, 33 when you wrote uh, Come Blow Your Horn? Yeah, or? but I started when I was 30. You started so when you were 30. So it took three years and all the paper I could find. It must have been frightening, though, to sort of jump off the abyss. I mean, you, I assume you're making an okay living writing for television. You could probably oh, have... Oh, very good living, yes. Um, but the times were changing and everything was moving to the coast. So if I wanted to keep on writing for television, I'd have to move to California. My wife didn't want to and I didn't want to. I was hoping I could have a th uh, career in the theater. But two or three of my good friends who worked some on the show of shows and uh, others who wrote their plays, they were shot down in like two nights and it was gone. Mm -hmm. So I figured those were the odds for me as well. And it nearly happened with Come Blow Your Horn. I mean, we finally sneaked in with the help of people like Noel Coward and Groucho Marx who came to see the plays and, uh, and put their stamp of approval on it. You are, uh, as Larry King was just saying the other night, the most successful playwright in the history of America. But you, you know, you grew up with not a lot of money. You grew up a uh, working class, a poor kid in New York. True. When did you realize and what was it like to be rich? To know I came from nothing and now I'm writing plays that I'm selling for $300,000 to Paramount Pictures. Well, I'll tell you when I first felt rich. Uh, there was a show called The Phil Silver Show, which was not the Bilko Show. It preceded it. And I was 19 years old. <clears throat> and they said, and my brother and I went for the uh, audition. And uh, they read our stuff and they said, okay, we hire you. It's $200 a week. And we came home and we said, $100 a week a piece. This is incredible until we got our first check and found out it was $200 a week each. I thought I was Rockefeller, so that's when I felt rich. I was struck by your self-confidence when you wrote Come Blow Your Horn, your first play, and you went through so many rewrites, and yet you just persevered. You were going to get that on. Yeah, I don't know if it was confidence as much as it was fear. I mean, it was like running for my life. If I didn't do it, if I didn't make it, if I gave up on it at any one time, it would be over for me, that dream and I would go out there and I would never have the aspirations fulfilled that I had for myself. So 
working on that was, was really a matter of life and death for me. Yeah. I would have survived it, but, uh, and I'm not even so sure that if it didn't work that I wouldn't go back and try another one. But fortunately it worked just enough. I was lucky enough not to have a major hit because they're very hard to overcome with the second play. But that just got by and it ran for two years and subsidized me to sit down and write Baffet in the Park and the Art Company. It's a little description in your book of the opening night of, uh, I believe it's Come Blow Your Horn, where there's a kid in a phone booth waiting to hear the reviews. Right, in Sardis. Yeah, and the reviews, uh, they're, not, they're not raves, kind of mixed reviews, but there's a kind of happiness he has about reporting to people that they aren't bad. And you say something about theater people there. You say right. that there's a core to them that might not be so nice. What is it about theater people? You spent your life in the theater. What is yeah. it about you people that makes you kind well, of difficult to be around? And well, are you like that? It happens to you people, too. <laughs> um, no, it, it comes from... Uh, We're on your team, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> it comes from, I think, the Oscar Wilde uh, line about it's not enough for you to succeed, your friends have to fail. And so that goes on in the theater all the time. Did you hear the show is no good in Boston? Yeah. You no, know, they love that. Oh, that's too bad. They're going to fail. Oh. But, iPhone rings off the hook when the show's <laughs> open out of town. Guess I know what? that. Uh, but they also jump on the bandwagon when they hear it's good. Yeah. Oh, great. I'm here. glad to hear that. Um, but there is this kid. I've never seen him in my life or since. And he's on the phone. And I'm standing on the table about 50 yards away, it seemed like, because I couldn't even get near it. I was lucky to get into the party in the first place. <laughs> and uh, he has a big smile on his face. And he nods. He goes, ah, ah. And he opens up the door. And he goes like this. <laughs> and... I was not so angry that we got a bad review, but it was that the this glee. little monster was so happy about it. I mean, I don't know if anyone cheered and said, yeah, it's a failure. Because there were a lot of people rooting for us. Yeah. But slowly it caught on because, as I said before, the Noel Coward and Groucho Marx thing. Did that make you a little uh, standoffish towards theater people, that experience? Well, it wasn't. Um, I was standoffish in my life, begin, yeah. so yes, I'm standoffish right now. <laughs> uh, but it made me wary because I knew, you know, you go in and so naive and so uh, hopeful that everybody works with each other. And, gee, Moss Hart's going to come in and give us a lot of help with this. Nobody came around right. to help. I was talking to some people this morning about you who've worked with you, uh, anonymous sources, you might say. Oh, I know. And then, you know. He wrote the, that, that book. About, <laughs> That's uh, right, Primary President. Colors. Right. Um, you know, they, one of them said, Neil Simon can seem to people in a rehearsal hall or in a theater, sometimes the cast members, a little cold. And he intimidates people, not only because of the enormous success he brings to any show he's involved in, but also just the personality he is. Uh, do you think of yourself as intimidating? No, it works the other way. you see I, how we're sweating the, here talking to I you. see the people intimidated, and I'm saying, why? I'm your friend. I mean, it, but I can understand it with actors. It's just as I would feel as a writer if somebody read over my shoulder and I said, don't, it's not ready yet. So the actors in rehearsal don't want me to see that they're doing it not well yet. They need to rehearse it. But I'm not ever watching them during the rehearsal. I'm only listening to the play, to what I have to rewrite. When we get past the second week, we're getting into the third week, and I've done all I want to do, then it's up to the director and the actors, and I would sometimes leave them. I'll give them much more time. And then by then, they're kind of happy that I come back because now they're ready to please me. Mm -hmm. You had this string of hits. Then did you ever write one that while it was going up you thought this isn't really that good? I knew it when I was writing Star Spangled Girl yeah. because the typewriter keys were like 15 pounds each. <laughs> like this. I hated it and I went to the producer Saint Suba who was the one who encouraged me on Barefoot when I wanted to give up on Barefoot. Right. He said believe me it's wonderful Barefoot. I gave him the finished product of, uh, of Star Spangled Girl, he says, this is better than Barefoot. And I said, no, it isn't. It stinks. Mm -hmm. It's no good. He says, listen to me. So I did, and we put it on. It didn't stink, and it ran a year, and it, it runs still, but I don't like the play mm -hmm. much. I went back and looked at some of uh, uh, reviews of some of the plays, and, and Frank Rich in the New York Times often <laughs> criticized you. <laughs> Yeah, she case, asked the nice questions. I case. asked the mean questions. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> he, you know, I, though, in this book, you do say, I, plays have got to be character driven. The humor comes from the character. And yet, you go back and you look over these Frank Church reviews, and he says, every time Neil Simon is going to reveal some moment, he throws in an easy joke there. Big complaint against I, you. I, that's Frank Rich. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here where I am today if it weren't for all of the other critics who I think gave me a, a, 
not the benefit of the doubt, but really enjoyed the plays. Lost in Yonkers, the, uh, the Pulitzer Prize, and the, uh, the Tony Award. A play you feel is your best play? Yes, absolutely. Why, why do you think he that's dismisses. your best play? But, um... It's the most profound, I think. It's the deepest. It really goes way deep into the characters. And those, the two women, the grandmother and Bella, are the two richest characters I've ever written. And they're not family. I don't have those people in my family. Uh, I reached into some place in my psyche that knew them. I knew how to write Bella. I never went wrong with Bella. I never went wrong with the grandmother. And when he dismisses it, then I just say, that's what I have to deal with. Well, you've always been in this, in this, in this bind, in a sense, that when you're writing light romantic comedies, they would say, they were saying he should try writing something serious. Right. When you try to write something serious, I remember Frank Rich saying he should go back to writing light exactly. romantic comedies. Exactly. So after a while, you have to get very thick-skinned, which is hard to do, uh, and you sweat over it and you get angry about it, and uh, and then it goes away. Do the critics as still Frank make... Rich did? <laughs> <laughs> did the critics still make you nervous? They make me nervous when they're right, and I and when they write something. As I said, did I quote the, the I did, I think, the Walter, Walter Kerr. No, well, he gave the, that great line, which you did not quote on. Neil Simon did not have an idea for a play this year, but he wrote it anyway. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a constructive <laughs> that negative girl? review. <laughs> I agreed with him completely, because I told him right from the be beginning. I told Saint about that. But with, uh, see, as I said before, with out-of-town critics, they can still be very helpful. They're, they see the baby being born. They're telling you how to take care of it. Um, with New York, it's either death or it's... Uh, or it's yes. Neil Simon, you've been Thank great. You, Thanks for joining us on Theater Talk. Never mind, I'll go. I don't do that. Don't make me feel guilty. I'll go. And get a quarter pound of butter. I bought a quarter pound this morning. Why don't you buy a half pound at a time? And suppose the house burned down this afternoon. <laughs> Why do I need an extra quarter pound of butter? <laughs> If my mother taught logic in high school, this would be some weird country. <laughs> Times says that our guest tonight is ushering in the new generation of Broadway power brokers. Uh, that's a heavy responsibility, Jordan Roth. I ain't gonna lie, it is. <laughs> Jordan Roth, who is the new uh, president of Jujamson Theaters, mm -hmm. which is one of the three companies here in New York that own all of the Broadway theaters. Uh, Jordan has produced on Broadway before, but now you're in a position to really basically run this industry. What are you going to do? Oh, Michael, seriously? <laughs> yes, what are you going to do? What does this industry need from someone your age that it's lacking? Um, well, I think, you know, first of all, I've been resisting specifics this early on. Um, but I will say that what I have been talking about and what I believe is perspective. Um, we are all in our business looking for trying to embrace and welcome a much wider uh, spectrum of audiences. Now, and this doesn't just mean young audiences. Uh, it is young audiences, absolutely, but it's really all audiences that haven't yet found their way to the theater, that haven't yet found themselves on stage in the theater. And particularly the Broadway theater, because yes, the Broadway theater is about. expensive for a lot of people mm -hmm. and this that the Broadway theater in some ways has priced itself out of the mainstream and middle class of New York society I think would you like to bring those people back to the Broadway theater um, the short answer is yes the longer answer is uh, what we have done is we, we offer really a very wide range of uh, price points mm -hmm. This doesn't get the news. This isn't the story. The story is premium the $250 price seats, yeah, premium tickets. Yeah. That's yeah. what makes a good story. But the truth of the matter is, is that there are a lot of entry points uh, for ticketing. And really what we've been doing is expanding uh, the spectrum, right? So yes, it's going up to 
premium tickets on a show that, that the market will bear that for. It's also balancing far down uh, with many discount tickets available. And truthfully, the discount market was built before the premium market. Yeah, well, that's true. The but discount, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a story if you had, like, student special seats again or the, what they did at Rand where they had the rush tickets? We that's a story, right? Every show has got them. Yeah. Okay. Every show in a G. Jamson house will have a uh, student discount policy or something? Every show on Broadway has, has student tickets, has rush tickets, has um, uh, a, a, a wide range of ticket availabilities. Um, do we need to do a better job at promoting them? Absolutely. Well, you know, because um, there's a g generation of theater owners who've been running this business for a long, long time. And they always used to say, and I'm curious to know if you think this should change, you didn't want to advertise your discounts because it made the show seem like it's not such a big hit and people only wanted to go to the hits. So the discounts were sort of done quietly. Do you think that has to change? Um, it, it's really show by show. Um, there are certain shows that that sort of patina is crucial. There are other shows that uh, promoting oneself as a much more populist, much more welcoming, much more uh, of the people, that's the image of that show. Like Spring Awakening, you did that. Like Spring Awakening, yeah. absolutely. Another issue on your vision, your changing the theater, is the kind of things that you will do where your taste lies. Mm -hmm. um, we have come off a good 15 years or so of a lot of revivals. A lot of shows that I feel were being picked by producers and theater owners who've been around a long time and these are the shows that, that they loved and want to bring back. Is it time for Broadway though to push on and find musicals that have music that is accessible to younger people? For me the answer is we want a Broadway that's big enough for all of it. it, it I, I, I resist that we have to choose between. Um, because really, uh, this is about honoring a legacy and celebrating a legacy as well as reinventing a form. It's not about cutting off half of the spectrum and only looking forward. It's about widening the spectrum and, having, and embracing all of it. Um, so very specifically, what are the shows in the last few years that you have personally responded to? Um, is it okay that I say the shows that were in our buildings? <laughs> <laughs> well, they may have um, been in your buildings yeah, because you never. liked them and you wanted to get them yeah, in your thank buildings. Thank you for <laughs> noticing. Um, well, I think, you know, for me, Spring Awakening, mm -hmm. um, uh, which was really the first show that I brought in when I came to Drew Jamson, um, that's a show that... Uh, is pointing in a new direction. Mm -hmm. But I also quickly want to say, so is Hair. Yes, look at Hair, wow. Hair is a revival in a new direction. There's a lot of frustration that I run into in the theater community that's beyond Broadway, that they can't get their work heard, that they can't get their work seen. Yeah. How are you scouting for, for the new musical talent, for the new voices? H how can they get your attention, Jordan Roth, and start working their way into the system? Um, I would say to keep doing what they're doing and to know that we're looking for them as hard as they're looking for us. Do you us. have people who come, go out and look and mm -hmm. scout? Absolutely. Great. Well, you're young enough. I, you can go out yourself, can't you? Hells yeah. <laughs> sit, sit in those basement floors. You don't have to wait for the, the limousines <laughs> to be summoned to uh, take you to Sardi's? Um, <laughs> He's not going to take that one. <laughs> nope, but thank you. Um, I think... Uh, we also, it, it's, it's really, it's not just me. We have a wide range of, of producers uh, and artistic directors at not-for-profit theaters in our city who are developing and looking and engaging on, on new work and new voices. We can expect you, Jamson, not just to be a landlord, but to be actively developing, producing shows. Um, Yes, although I think you know our core business is in the theaters, um, and so the goal, how, however we can help those shows to get to the stage, that's the important piece. What we have now is, uh, as I was saying earlier, a, a, a really vibrant community of producers, both 
young and old mm -hmm. who are uh, working with us to bring these these plays and musicals to the stage. Mm. It's going to be an interesting time for you. From your lofty perch, what do you <laughs> see, though, as particular financial challenges for the industry? We're, we're in the middle of a recession, but Broadway seems to have survived pretty well. Are you confident that it can hold up and do as, it's, as well as it's been doing, or do you have any concerns about economic problems on the horizon? Uh, yes to both. Meaning? Uh, meaning I think that um, the economics of our business are uh, always challenging. Um, it's very expensive to put on shows. It's very expensive to put on shows. Um, and that's something that we as an industry are constantly trying to, to explore and engage with and get creative on. Um, we don't want to keep having to raise ticket prices to cover production expenses. Um, that's not the goal. Um, and so that's an ongoing challenge. At the same time, what we learned from last season is our audiences will continue to come to the theater if we produce great work. So you're going to have to take on the unions and... Uh, no, it's not take on the unions. Work it's the whole cost with. structure of the industry. It's work with. I. I there's nobody who works in the theater that wants it to be untenable for audiences or for people who work in it. This is, this is very much a collective effort uh, to move forward. Mm. Right. But the unions have certain uh, financial demands. I mean, when they do their next negotiations, it's certainly they want the... the industry to be tenable, but at the same time, they want, raises. They want what they want. <laughs> no, they, they want raises and, and they want, you know, they, they don't, they, they're, they're not seeing your profit margin as sacrosanct. We are a highly unionized uh, environment and that's part of the business. Um, and that's okay. Are you learning all the contracts? <laughs> <laughs> you've got a good guy, Paul Libin, who's worked there for a long time, who knows the contracts. But are you learning Indeed. now that you've got this uh, position running these theaters? Are you delving into it's, every stagehand contract? Uh, it's, every uh, it's very important to to really get your hands in and, and to understand uh, understand those contracts because they're important to the people who work with us. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, Jordan. We wish you luck um, running Jujamps in theaters. I Thank mean, you. Welcome youth. Keep, to, looking, <laughs> keep to, looking for those new artists and new trends. To keep them. supporting them. We Thank you. Them. <laughs> Good luck. And uh, at your theaters now, you've got Fela. Fela is coming in. Finian's Rainbow. Yeah. A little night music. Miss Catherine Zeta Jones, Angela Lansbury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good cast. Uh, and the Mighty Jersey Boys and Hair continue. Yeah. You have a few that'll still anchor the chain, which will give you the money to e experiment with new things. New things don't have to not make money. No, that's true. Good point. All right, thanks a lot, and good luck um, as the um, uh, leader of a new generation of Broadway power brokers, and for now the face of Broadway. Bye, bye. was a big opening on Broadway the other day for Bye Bye Birdie. It was very splashy, especially considering it was pouring rain that night. So we sent our intrepid correspondents Andrew Andrew of East Village Radio to cover the event, and this is what they came up with. Andrew Andrew here at Henry Miller's Theater. Brand new, renovated from the ground up for the premiere of Bye Bye Birdie. Tonight, the big ribbon-cutting event starring Mayor Bloomberg. And many other notables of the New York theater community. It doesn't let the rain stop. They still come out to see Bye Bye Birdie, produced by Sorry, the Roundabout guys. Theater. Sorry, guys, I need to ask you to move. Go, gotta Thank go. You. Bye Bye Birdie's about a teenage heartthrob. Growing up, who was your teenage heartthrob? Oh, God. Um, Keith Partridge and Greg Brady. Oops. Oh, I guess I just said too much, didn't I? All of my teenage heartthrobs growing up were dead. <laughs> I'm afraid. I grew up on black and white movies, so I was really very, very disappointed to find out that they, they were all deceased, you know, when I came. It was a surprise. Not a, not a terribly happy one. Growing up, well, I was a big fan of Led Zeppelin, so, you know, that, whatever that means. Bye Bye Birdie is about a teenage heartthrob. Growing up, did you have a teenage heartthrob? Oh, I was one. <laughs> that was me, folks. Mm.
I was an 18-year-old, I'm a 19-year-old pop singer in England. Uh, uh, I was the, the first pop singer for George Martin. Would you believe it? This show, he gets drafted. Are there any public figures that you think should be drafted into the army now? Oh, I don't know. Who would you like to see go to Iraq? I don't know. I don't want. I want to see. I want to see it end. I don't want to see anyone going to, to war. Um, I remember that was one of my biggest fears as a child growing up during Vietnam that I would be drafted. You know, so. Well, lucky for all of us, you were not. Well, thank you, thank you, because it would have been a mess. I, I'd be uh, draft. Oh, there. I think there's a too long a line, and it's very dangerous territory. But use your imagination. Well, I'd, I'd like to see George Bush actually do a retroactive. Uh, it, enlistment. Any celebrities that I would like to be drafted into the war now? Man, I don't know. Let me get some thought. I'll get back to you after the show. Okay, good. We'll see how Gina does tonight. Oh!